Hello, welcome to River Reflections. You just saw our church in that role in. Know that you're always welcome to come and visit us. There will be a website on the screen soon, and then you can jot it down, go on there, uh, click bulletins, and then you'll be able to see what kinds of things are coming up and get a general idea of the things that we do. Also on the page, the first page of it, you'll see the address. Let's see, I think my phone number is on there, my cell phone, if you need to call for any reason to ask about anything. Uh, you're just welcome to check us out either to just visit. We meet on Saturdays, which means if you go to a Sunday church, you're not going to be missing your own if you visit us. We also meet on Wednesday nights. But we're a full gospel church. That means we believe that everything that's in the book of Acts is still happening today. We don't believe it finished at the end of the New Testament writings. We believe the Lord's still in the business of uh, supernatural gifts, miracles, speaking in tongues as uh, evidence of the baptism in the Spirit. Uh, we believe that right now, and we make a joyful noise to the Lord. Kids get up with flags and dancing from time to time. So do the grown people from time to time. We're pretty expressive at our church. Just know that if you've been asking the Lord to give you a church home, it could be that it's River of Life. My husband Robert and I founded the church back in January of 1980 in our living room. And the Lord is still blessing us even now, years and years and decades later. Tonight, I want to talk to you about grief, grief and pain. In this world, you are going to encounter grief and pain. You can try to avoid it if you want to. You can try to stuff your feelings if you want to. But you're going to encounter things that cause you sadness and hurt. There's a verse in the Bible that says, 1 Peter 5, verse 7, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Now, either this week or next week, when I'll do the second part of this, I'll talk more about the remedy to grief and pain. But there is no quick fix. Sometimes we just cast our cares and when they bubble up again you give them to the Lord again and he cares and he walks with you he gives you the grace to walk through the pain I will say from personal experience and I'm not a young girl I'm 74 and I've been through a lot a lot of grief and pain in my life some I've had some highlights that were never resolved for instance, I had a brother who I loved with all my heart, and unless he changed on his deathbed, as far as I know, he never really said, Lord, you are my Lord. I believe you saved me. I'm yours. I don't know. He might have done it on his deathbed because he was surely raised in the church. But all of my life, that was a grief to me that my brother did not openly receive the Lord, and openly lead a life that was evident of that. That's one grief we bear. Sometimes our grief is directly from the heart of God, and that's a good illustration of one of them, is people that aren't saved who we love, or people that are oppressed that we read about. That's God's heart to be grieved over some things, even in the news. I was saying when I was sharing this sermon on pain and grief in our, our church, that some of you who are prayer warriors Sometimes you grieve and you're not sure what for. And then you remember, oh, <clears throat> on TV tonight I heard about so-and-so and it's really touched my heart. And then if it's still there and you realize that's what's causing you to be sad, you know that's your signal. You're supposed to be praying for that person that you saw on TV or an obituary maybe you read. And the name of the widow kind of stood out to you like a neon sign and there's kids involved, and you, you felt God's heart of grief. So we don't only grieve for our own hurts and pains. Sometimes it's over somebody else's soul, somebody else's oppression. There's a, <clears throat> I'll give you another illustration. There were a group of girls some years back in Nigeria that were kidnapped by some Muslim extremists. And 
some later on, the Nigerian government was able to negotiate their getting out of that situation. Once they got out of it, some of the stories started to come out that they were beaten, they were pretty much enslaved, many were forced into marriages. But the thing that can bring the grief, and this article that I read uh, was written not that long ago, even though the kidnapping occurred maybe six years ago, I'm not sure exactly, but the stories are coming out now. They were in there several years. The story came out, too, that there's still a good hundred left because those girls were married to guys in there that then, for whatever reason, they weren't allowed to be released. And if you think about that long and hard enough, these were mostly Christian girls. They were forced to have Quran uh, lessons to convert to Islam. Some said they did not in their hearts. They resisted it. But there's things you do secretly inside, and then there's things you do to keep from getting killed. And these were young girls. And when I read about a story like that and realize there's still some young girls that might not ever see their mom and dad again, they might not have, there's one girl in particular, they said uh, they found out a new sister had been born, and that girl's not even aware of the fact she's got a new sister, doesn't know what her family's up to. I'm talking about things that grieve the heart of God. We have the Spirit of God inside of us, so sometimes our grief is kind of a, a just we pick it up from what we see and read. It's not always about ourselves. But then other times, one of the things that are, is very common to grieve about is when there's a death in the family of a child, of a spouse, of a father, of a mother. And sometimes I, I was listening to a woman on YouTube preach a sermon and by the way, I, I told the church, I don't know that I've ever preached a, a sermon on pain and grief before in the whole 40-some-plus years that I've been preaching and teaching. I was teaching several years before I even became a pastor. I don't think I ever chose the theme pain and grief before. And really what triggered my desire to read more into it and literally, and I don't want to have time to share all the illustrations tonight, but literally go through the Word to see what kinds of things grieve people in the Bible and what God's response was when they cried out to Him. There's several of them, like Esther and Jeremiah and Hezekiah. There's a whole list of people that cried out to God, people to Jesus. My son's going through this. Would you please heal him? And to entreat with tears, I... I don't know why, but until I specifically looked in the word for people that cried with tears, Hannah wanting a son, and she's crying in the temple out to God, and the priest, Eli, thought she was drunk because she was so grieved and so beside herself. She said, no, I'm not drunk. I want a son, and if God gives me a son, I'll, I'll first give him to you. I mean, she was just desperate. God blessed her with many kids after Samuel. God heard her prayer. He saw her tears. And many of the illustrations I saw in the Bible, it says God heard his prayer. He saw the tears. Other times there's tears, and then you see the Lord responded to those tears. When we think about grief and our own grief, what we have to know is he wants us to cast what I read. He wants us to give that grief to him. Furthermore, in the body of Christ, in the new covenant, we're all one body. And the Bible says we're to bear the infirmities of the weak, the weaknesses of others. It also says when one laughs, everybody should laugh. When, a, when one grieves, everybody should grieve. In other words, feel with other people. Rejoice. If somebody gets a bonus at work and they're finally able to get a car and they don't have to take the bus anymore, we should rejoice with them. They're happy. They're thrilled. they got to step up and their life has become way more comfortable and, and to put a smile on their face and they're happy because they dreamt of having a car instead of take, taking the bus for a long, long, long time and now they've got one and they're happy. The Word says when somebody's happy, be happy with them. The Word says if somebody goes through something sorrowful, be sorrowful with them. We're supposed to care for each other and goes right back to the, the Lord's heart in us 
because the Lord shares our griefs and the Lord uh, likes to dance over us and laugh over us too. That's in the Old Covenant. I just read those verses not long ago where he'll rejoice over us with singing. He feels with us, be it joy, be it sorrow. He's touched with our feelings. He cares about us. Now for me, you know, now somebody could say, well, if he cares so much, why did he let this happen in the first place? Some of those questions there are no answers for specifically why it happened to you. The best answer I can come up with is as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, sin was brought into the world, and with sin came the grief and the pain. Before sin, there were no tears. And the good news is once Jesus Christ comes back, or even if we die and go to heaven, that'll happen there too, that we won't have any more tears. But when he comes back, he also says he's going to wipe away every tear. And then there's not going to be any more crying or tears. Why? Because there's not going to be any more sin. When sin entered the world, there came the tears. There came the grief. Everything bad, everything you're feeling that's pain, it's because now that sin has entered the world, and even probably more important, now that the devil is the prince of the air and has rulership over this world, we're in a warfare against him. Now, in Christ, we prevail, we triumph, even through tears, we triumph over pain and grief. But there are times we go through pain and grief, even though there's a, often a real sense of the presence of the Lord, there's still tears, there's still hurt, there's still pain. I've never lost a child to death, but I'm told that people that go through that, that's probably the worst pain. You know, you lose a four-year-old to a drowning or a car accident, whatever, I'm told that's one of the worst pains that anybody can go through. I've never been there, so I don't understand what that feels like. But the Lord does. The Lord understands, and he's right there grieving with us. There's going to be grief. There's going to be tears. There's an old song that says, Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Now, how I got on this topic in the first place is because we were watching this lady on TV, and this lady's name is Mickey Magnum. She's United Pentecostal uh, singer, preacher, and from a family that is very entrenched and known in those circles. But she lost her father. And for some reason, he apparently was what the world calls her North Star. She didn't use that term, but I've heard other people use that terminology, that there's some people in our life we just look to for direction, for strength, for uh, balance, just being solidly rooted because we can always lean on that person. Well, her daddy was such a person, and when he died, she didn't want anybody around her. She didn't want anybody comforting her. She was out of it for quite, it sounded like, I'm not sure if it was weeks or months, but it was at least weeks that she just leave me alone. And one thing she admitted, in fact, she repented to the people for it. She said, I refused to be comforted. Now that struck me, just those words. I refused to be comforted. I thought, whoa, that's different. But then um, I remembered then I looked it up to verify that that's exactly what it said. Do you remember the story when Joseph was thrown in the ditch by his jealous brothers because Jacob did prefer Joseph above the others? His brothers were jealous. He threw him in a pit, and then uh, they liked to kill him, but then some people came along, and they pretty much gave him or sold him to those people. But to figure out a way to explain the loss to Jacob, they put some animal blood on that famous colt of many colors and took the coat to the daddy and said, he's gone, he's dead. And we find that story in Genesis 37. And it says in verse 35 of that chapter, and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I'll go down into the grave unto my son mourning. 
thus his father wept for him. So Jacob didn't want anybody to even try to comfort him. He refused to be comforted, and he went in his grave mourning. Now, I, I don't even pretend to know the kind of grief my sister who was preaching felt, but I do know one thing. If we go through something like that, as soon as we possibly can, we need to take that grief and cast it on to the Lord. All those cares, all those concerns, all that loneliness, because he says in Hebrews, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He is right there feeling along with us. There's a verse in the Old Covenant that when his people were going through something, it says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. In other words, I'm hurting right along with you. While you're going through this stuff, the Lord is saying, I feel it too. And the sooner we can get to his arms, you say, well, that's the problem. I can't see nor feel his arms. I'll tell you something. You, just one position you could assume. Get down on your knees at your bed. Put your head down and just begin to talk to him. Pour out. Uh, your heart, and, and you'll begin to feel a sense of his arms enfolding you and caring for you. If you have the Spirit of Christ in you, you will sense his presence after you have sincerely cast all your cares upon him. But apparently there's a state, because both Jacob was a God-fearer and this woman preaching was too, so evidently there's a point in grief sometimes where a person just refuses or can't be or whatever to be comforted. What I thought was kind of funny, and she did too, she said at that point where she couldn't receive comfort from anybody, she's walking down the road. This was back to our sister Mickey here who was preaching. She's walking down the road, and she sees a sister approaching around the, the street, and the first thing she thought is, oh, I don't want that woman saying anything to me. I don't want somebody was on to be bothered by anybody talking to me. And, and the woman didn't say anything to her. And as soon as she passed her by on the street, her next thought was, she knows I was hurting. Why didn't she say anything to me? And I was just thinking about, yeah, sometimes you hurt so bad that you don't know what you want. On the one hand, she thought she didn't want the woman to say it. On the other hand, she's hurt because the woman didn't say anything to her. So that leaves us with one choice. Lord, I know my brother, my sister, whoever is hurting, what would you have me to do? And sometimes maybe it doesn't really matter what they think they want. Sometimes we can give a cup of cold water to somebody that didn't know they were thirsty until they drank it. Then they're grateful afterwards. I, I did share in church too that when I was 10, I broke my arm and they took me to the hospital and it was badly broken. It wasn't just sort of broken. It, it needed immediate attention and redoing and but the first thing the doctor did is he started to fill up a needle. And I was terrified of that needle. I was in so much pain, the thought of a pinprick adding to my pain was overwhelming. So I was crying against the thought of them giving me a shot with my little 10-year-old self. And no, 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 don't do it, don't do it, I hurt too bad. And he overrode my protest, gave me a shot. And it wasn't very long before I was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me that shot because it indeed, it was Demerol. It took the pain away. Well, we're like that sometime too. We could refuse the comfort of the Lord, the comfort of, of friends, but maybe there's things that we can do as the body of Christ that at first the person thinks they don't want that particular thing, but in fact, it's the heart of God that causes us to say or do or give whatever it was we were led to do. Obviously, we have to be really sensitive because, for instance, Jacob's case and this uh, sister's case who was preaching, her pain was so deep she didn't know what to do with herself. I can't identify with that, but I hear her. The other thing that that really hit me uh, while listening to that was uh, the Lord showed me how selfish I can be sometime, that if somebody resists what I believe I can do to help them, be it comforting grief or a counseling word or whatever, as a pastor, as a mother. And I liken to it because my child, E.G., my son, now he's not a kid, he's 49, but way back in the day when he was 7, 8, oh, 
trying to make a meal that would make him happy, not anymore, but back then, was very, very hard. And I could take it personally that I was just a bad cook, bad mom, whatever. And I can, as a pastor, and maybe you as a friend, can feel the same way sometimes that if your friend gets hurt and you come with what you think could really help them, and they're like, no, I don't want to talk. I don't want to deal with this. Leave me alone. I'd rather be alone. And instead of our, this woman helped me with this, with her sermon, because instead of in the past, my going, well, for crying out loud, now it comes out, you can't stand me and don't even want to hear what I have to say. In other words, thinking about myself and how they're receiving what I have to give, instead of thinking, wow, this person, I know we're friends. They're in such deep pain that even what I might have to say to them they, they can't handle it. They're, it's, they're just suffering too much right now to handle anything other than absolute, so some people gr grieve, silence and, and solitude. That's the only thing that's helping them right now. And in the past, I would have been quick to take that personally. Like, you know me. You know if I'm going to open my mouth and say something, it's either going to be from the word or something I feel led to say or something that comforted me in the past. And that's valid. Paul tells people in the Bible, you know what, sometimes you go through things and the same comfort you receive while you're going through it, give that to other people when they're going through it. I've actually told people that are grieving, you know what, if you're up to it, see if you can journal some of what gives you comfort because the one thing you can probably take away, from, one of the things you can take away from this extreme pain is now I've got some tools which, with which to bless other people when they're going through a lot of pain. Well, you're making your notes, you're journaling, you're figuring out, well, that comforted me, that comforted me. And then you work your way through, and now your friend is hurting, and you're like, oh, goody, I got some tools that I know I can use to help them in their time of need. And you go over there and try to use your tools, and they're like, get out of my face. I want to be alone. I'm saying in the past, that kind of thing would have really caused me to feel bad. But hearing this lady say, and even reading about Jacob, his response to Joseph, thinking he was dead, I now realize sometimes people's pain is way bigger than I imagined. And no one at that moment can necessarily give them face to face what they would want. Now, perhaps if we were to come to somebody's home and just set a hot meal inside the front door and give a kind of a little high and leave, maybe they could handle that. Again, we have to find out what the Lord might say to us about what to do. It's very natural for the body of Christ to want to comfort people that are mourning and wounded. Um, I've had experience, I'm talking about grief and pain here, I've had experience where somebody's dad, for instance, died, I'm thinking of a particular thing, and what, for whatever reason, Robert and I ended up at their home after the dad's funeral, and the person was making a list of all the people that said ignorant things to them in their grief, like, so-and-so said such and such, and they really thought that would help. And I tried as nicely as I could to say, you know what? In fact, this particular funeral was not right in town and easy to get to. This is years ago. But my response, as nice as I could say it, was, you know what? The very fact that person showed up, never mind what ignorant things they might have said, never mind that just be happy and feel loved by the fact they came and tried, awkwardly as it might have been. Because I know the day that I didn't really want to go to the funeral home visiting time or to the funeral because I honestly didn't know what to say to that person. Now I think we're all in the habit of saying, I'm sorry for your loss, I'm sorry for your loss, I'm sorry, you know, that's, that's the go-to line now. Um, Sometimes you want to say something more creative and heartfelt than that. But it's, it's difficult sometimes. But I say to those of us that are grieving, if somebody tries to help us, but what they're saying, we're thinking, well, that's an ignorant thing to say. Like, 
Your mom sure looks good in her coffin. She doesn't even look like she's dead laying there. I mean, <laughs> it just kind of makes you want to laugh for somebody to say that. Like, she is dead, and it's a good undertaker we got here or whatever. But you know what? Even if somebody says something like that, the facts are there. We, sh we need to allow people, as soon as we're ready to receive it, to allow people to be blessed by reaching out and loving on us when we are mourning. Uh, one la I'm going to take a couple of principles. I only have a couple of minutes left. But another thing I want to bring out is if you're the one mourning, it is not healthy to spend too much time stuffing it under. If you're trying to get through it by not facing it and tasting of the grief, so to speak, that is not healthy. You really do need to, in addition to crying out to God in prayer, you know, unless you can't think of a single soul on earth, I mean, most people have some friends that they could go to and say, this is how I'm feeling. Um, I've been crying off and on all day for a couple of weeks now, and I appreciate your prayers because I know I can't keep living like this. I'll probably grieve off and on all my life for my mom, but this hard grief is really hard to deal with. Could you pray for me? You know, people like Jesus people, people with the Spirit of God within them, like to comfort those that are grieving. There's a, a joy in being that close. Joy is not the exact right word, but you know what I mean. There's a, a, I'll just say joy. There's a joy in being a close enough community that we can go through the tears with each other. We can visit in the hospital and pray for each other and feel happy that we were able to go in there and give something. We like to give to each other. Yes, we need to be sensitive to what stage the griever is at and not be overbearing. But at the same time, when we're grieving, there comes a time we need to let the body of Christ minister to our grief. And above all, let the Lord minister to your grief. Amen?